is snapshots from an institution. One, Jiao. She lies in bed the way a letter lies in an envelope. Her eyes are blank and her mouth is open. The image appears to be black and white. Two, Ching San. He waits in an armchair by the main entrance, dressed in a thick round suit, a plaid blue cap in his left hand and a battered silver-tipped cane between his legs. The chair, beige vinyl, a two-inch slash in the upper left corner, is meant to frame him, but he's too tall, too robust. His shoulders exceed the backrest. His legs stretch out on the mosaic floor across an ochre diamond and well into the adjacent roseate square. Each time the scarred double doors of the main entrance open, he smiles. He's waited one hour and 45 minutes so far. He's missed lunch. His thighs tingle and his stomach growls, but there's no sign of his son. Three, the place. It's a collection of sandstone buildings in California mission style with red tiled roofs and a hilltop location coveted with equal fervor by real estate developers and urban preservationists. If you bisected the city of San Francisco on, on its axes, on its horizontal and vertical axes, and went to that location, you would find yourself gazing at the view shown by this wide-angle shot. Greenery stretches top to bottom on the left, and a parking lot for 200 cars does the same on the right. In life, as in this photograph, a vast and gently sloped front lawn popular with local dog walkers fills much of the foreground. Behind the lawn is a traffic circle, and behind that a wide staircase and a wheelchair ramp that bring visitors to a terrace where giant pots of native plants surround the main entrance. A newly paved drive lined by twin rows of sentinel palms connects the 11 buildings above with the security gate and busy street below. But the eco-friendly landscaping and handsome square bell notwithstanding, excuse me, the handsome square bell tower notwithstanding, only the most inattentive passerby would mistake this place for a college campus or corporate headquarters. The walls and windows are streaked with grime, and too many of the people coming and going wear uniforms. Four, quality time. This photo was taken a few hours ago, though it might just as easily have been taken yesterday or last week or last month, or last year. In it, Zhao and Jing San sit in the fenced garden adjacent to Building 7. Although it's a warm, sunny morning, Jing San is perched at the far end of a black metal bench wearing his suit coat and cap, and Zhao is beside him in her wheelchair bundled in blankets and scarves. He visits her seven days a week and stays six hours each day, taking three buses from and then back to his studio apartment downtown. Every other Sunday when his daughter calls by long distance telephone from her home in another state, he tells her it's no problem. What else would I do, he asks. A question for which his daughter has no satisfying answer. And so, each morning at more or less 10 o'clock, he arrives, rolls his wife outside, wipes her drool, makes sure she's warm, then watches the bees on the bogan bougainvillea or the liquid food dropping through plastic tubing into a body he once lay awake admiring, timing himself to see how long he could hold back before reaching out with a foot, a fingertip, his tongue. It's much like caring for a baby, he explains to his daughter, except without the sweet smells. 
without the hope. Five, history. In the late 19th century, when the institution opened, its residents were called inmates. The able-bodied majority worked in the kitchens and laundry, women. Or, as shown in this recently colorized archival photograph on maintenance road and, and repair crews, men. They also operated a large working farm and provided mending and tailoring services to other inmates, to the paid staff, and for a small fee to the people in the surrounding neighborhoods of St. Francis Wood, Twin Peaks, and the Inner Sunset. Now there are no able-bodied residents. These days, the average age is 76, and even the crazies don't want to live here. Even the homeless, though they do live here, unofficially and undeniably inside and out. Look back at snapshot three. Use a magnifying glass. See the colorful mounds beneath the drooping fronds of the sentinel palms and on the margins of the litter-strewn lawn? If this were videography, you'd notice that the mounds move from time to time, a bottle raised to eager lips, an ill-defined shape morphing into something vertical and recognizable, standing and stretching before ambling off. But even with a still image, you can appreciate how very many mounds there are, curled under bushes and burrowed in heaps of trash on the extensive grounds the city doesn't have money to maintain. Six, Charles. Ching San and Zhao's oldest son <coughs> arrives two hours late and doesn't apologize. The camera captures the exact moment when his left hand with its manicured fingernails and thick gold wedding band touches down on the sleeve of his father's coat. The only moment it touches down. He's the piece that doesn't belong. Standing in the institution's ancient foyer in his silk suit with his $60 haircut and limited edition platinum watch. Sesame Street, his made in America daughter would shout, delighted, but he doesn't bring her here. Seven, context. From the street outside, there's a loud pop. The telephoto lens zooms in on a boy, face down on the sidewalk. This image actually is black and white. White cement, black boy. Eight, family meeting. A group of professionals, all women, three brown and two white, gather in Zhao's room. Ching San stands by the door, his head pressed against the sun-warmed wall, his discount store loafers firmly planted on the speckled linoleum. From beneath half-lowered lids, he watches Charles with the doctor and nurses and social worker, watches as his son charms and instructs them he himself does not speak. There's so much he might say in his language or under different circumstances, but nothing that can be said here. Nine, the doctor. She steals a glance at her watch while explaining to Charles how sometimes families choose to, forget, to forego treatments such as resuscitation and hospitalization and sometimes even x-rays and blood draws and antibiotics, everything but that which increases the patient's comfort. And then, fingering the name badge that hangs from her neck like a long, gaudy necklace, a faded photograph on the flip side of the plastic sleeve, she explains how such decisions are not only perfectly legal, but ethical and moral as well based as they are on respect and compassion for the afflicted loved one. The doctor's slim, stylish watch is secured with a tiny piece of duct tape, and her shoes need rehealing. 
But if she saw this photograph, she wouldn't focus the way most women her age would on the physical indignities of her middle decades. The lips in need of lipstick, the crimped skin forming vertical lines between her brows and furrows around her lips. A body now more attractive clothed than naked. No. This doctor would see only the photograph within the photograph. The years ago Hawaiian holiday shot of her children from the days when there were three of them. Not only her now teenage baby girl and collegiate boy, but also an oldest child, her firstborn, a lost child, who taught her everything she knows about respect and compassion. Ten. Questions. All eyes turned toward Ching San as the social worker in her smartly tapered skirt, faux cashmere sweater, and three-inch heels asks in his language, which is also her language, or at any rate, the language of her childhood. Did you ever talk to your wife about what she would and would not want as she got older? But before Ching San can answer, Charles steps into the center of the room and poses his own questions, first in English and then in that other language, flipping easily back and forth and smiling at the staff while keeping his eyes on the older, more foreign version of himself. He asks his father whether he still loves his mother and whether Ching San still enjoys spending time with Zhao and wants to do everything possible to help her and keep her alive. Or whether he agrees with the staff that his wife would be better off dead. Immediately and simultaneous, uh, simultaneously, the social worker and doctor protest, but the son silences them without even a glance. His hands raise like international stop signs as he completes the translation into his father's language. Ching San coughs and smiles at the floor. From beyond the open door comes the click hum of an electric wheelchair in the hallway. Then Ching San answers, yes, 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 and no. What else can he say? He doesn't know what Zhao would tell him if she could speak. He imagines, but he does not know. 11. Rights and Privileges With her healthy young son beside her, Zhao looks as if she's already dead. In the distance, distant impoverished, impover, excuse me, in the distance impoverished province they come from, she would be. So would Ching Sao. Their children might even be dead, at least some of them. But this is America. And in America, any person, rich or poor, can be kept alive even when they can't walk or talk, eat or think, even when they can't say, no, please, stop. And especially when the doctor is told, do everything by a man with a good job, good English, and real leather shoes. 12. The score. On his way out the door, Charles nearly trips over a young man in a wheelchair rolling down the corridor in a hospital gown and backwards baseball cap. White cords dangle from the young man's ears and a McDonald's milkshake rests in his wheelchair cup holder. It's hard to tell from this one shot and Charles doesn't notice. But this young man is working. And though the work he's doing is very different from the work of his 19th century predecessors, it's the sort of work he's done since he arrived in America at age 11. A kind of work that on this particular day looks like this. A kid from outside, hoping to make good with the crew, slipped him a knife in a 32 ounce milkshake cup. And while the Building 7 social worker was at the Zhao Liang family meeting, 
The young man, quadriplegic from a gunshot wound, used the knife in his more functional hand to break into her office and steal her laptop computer. An act he considers totally legitimate since, as he told the kid, that bitch don't do jack for me, dog. <laughs> Next, with the tidy chrome machine hidden beneath his lap blanket, he wheeled himself down to the Total Care Unit kitchen, where he sold it at 130 retail value to a woman who smelled of garlic and dirty dishwater and barely spoke English, but knew her kids needed computers if they were going to avoid ending up like the young man from whom she bought the computer. Now, unaware that he's being photographed, the young man pushes past Charles and heads to the ambulatory dementia unit where he scores an A-bomb and some baby tea off one of the aides. Then he follows the painted green line along the cement walls of the underground tunnel system to the main building, takes the service elevator up to the lobby, and just beyond a tan vinyl chair with a rip in the upper left corner, enters a handicapped restroom with a functioning door lock and enough floor space for him to do a back-to-back -back and have a happy nod undisturbed by staff or security. Thirteen, local color. At the nurse's station on the total care unit in building seven, the doctor's left hand rests on a thick binder bearing the name Jiao Yang. And her right hand reaches out toward a dispenser of round red stickers. An assortment of stickers in other colors already decorates the chart's spine. Blue, incommunicado. Purple, skin breakdown. And yellow, nothing by mouth. The latter two not quite obscuring the stickers they replaced 18 months earlier. Green, fall risk. And orange, danger to staff. A nurse's thick brown <laughs> fingers land on a doctor's forearm. The red sticker means do not resuscitate. And the doctor cannot put it on this or any other chart without the family's approval. 14. Nightfall. The wide angle lens again. This shot offering a sunset bird's eye view of jutting pallid buildings in the middle of a forested city hilltop. Cars like forgotten toys in a giant parking lot. Ceramic pots huddled as cockroaches might in the shadows on the terrace of the main entrance and a huge swath of surrounding land dark and menacing in the dusk. Invisible at this hour are the institution's raison d'etre. The residents grouped in the 11 buildings by disease and functional status, as if they'd been apprehended at the end of their lives, striving for something large and ugly, a defining theme of the sort that would be accomplished by a very modern symphony it's scraping, screeching, and pounding, punctuated at regular intervals by a prolonged and disturbing silence. Fifteen, the gift. Long after his usual departure time, Ching San opens a folding chair and sits down beside Zhao. Her bed has silver bars along both sides, but there's space enough between the slats for him to reach in without taking off his suit coat. For a while, he sits quietly, stroking her hair or shoulder. And then suddenly, he leans forward and, at a just audible level, begins to hum. As darkness replaces the grounds and city beyond the window across the room, he moves fluidly from one melody to the next, choosing ballads of love and longing that decades and continents ago, he used to tease her for singing, calling them silly and sentimental. Except when he sings to her, the room is quiet. Except in the late mornings when he wraps her in blankets and takes her outside, Jiao lies in this bed, bars up, wearing nothing more than a blue and white gown that ties at the neck and waist, and a blanket 
the aids tucked beneath her chin. When she first moved to the institution, she sometimes also wore a vest that was green and yellow, zipped up the back, and had long straps that the nurses knotted around the silver bars, holding her firmly in place. But she hasn't needed the vest for a very long time. Zhao and Ching San did not ask to come to this country. They came for their children, and their children's children, and their grandchildren's children. They came willingly and without complaint. If he had to do it over, Ching San would do the same again. And he has only to remember the respect with which the doctor and nurses and social worker listened to Charles to know this much about his wife for sure. So would Jack. 